Good morning. This morning, the scripture is from Psalm 145, verses 3 to 18. Great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. No one can measure his greatness. Let each generation tell its children of your mighty acts. Let them proclaim your power. I will meditate on your majestic, glorious splendor and your wonderful miracles. Your awe-inspiring deeds will be on every tongue. I will proclaim your greatness. Everyone will share the story of your wonderful goodness. They will sing with joy about your righteousness. The Lord is merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. The Lord is good to everyone. He showers compassion on all his creation. All your works will thank you, Lord, and your faithful followers will praise you. They will speak of the glory of your kingdom. They will give examples of your power. They will tell about your mighty deeds and about the majesty and glory of your reign. For your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, your rule throughout all generations. The Lord always keeps his promises. He is gracious in all he does. The Lord helps the fallen and lifts those bent beneath their loads. The eyes of all who look to you and hope and give you and give them their food as they need it. When you open your hand, you satisfy the hunger and thirst of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in everything he does. He is filled with kindness. The Lord is close to all who call on him. Yes, to all who call on him in truth. He grants the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cries for help and rescues them. The Lord protects all those who love him, but he destroys the wicked. I will praise the Lord, and may everyone on earth bless his holy name forever and ever. Thank you, Suzanne. <clears throat> Several weeks ago, um, Peggy and I took in the New Dundee fireworks. I had never been before. Uh, I, I heard about it for years, but I could never get there because I was helping or organizing or leading Pitch and Praise, and it went right through the, uh, th- through the holiday weekend, <clears throat> and then we were cleaning up for days afterwards. Uh, so I just hear the stories about it. So Peggy and I finally got to go to the New Dundee fireworks uh, this year, and I was overwhelmed at how many other people um, decided to go at the same time. The place was just crawling with people. But, um, you know, we're, we're waiting for the fireworks to begin, and at first there's there's this initial volley, like there's just a few little lights that, that, that go up. Um, and they're really not supposed to impress anybody. That's just letting you know that the fireworks is going to start soon. So you should be moving into your into your place of seating so that you can take in what's going on. <clears throat> so there's these little these little startup things that let you know the show is starting soon, and then you wait for a few minutes, and then uh, it gets a little darker, and and the fireworks begin. And at first, it's it's kind of cool. And then, and the further you go, uh, the fancier it gets. There's more lights, more flash. And when you get to the finale, they go all out. There's this crescendo of noise and color, uh, and everybody is ooing and aahing. Um, and it's, it's this final fanfare. And Psalm 145, which the lectionary brings us to today, is kind of like that. It's kind of like the final fanfare of the fireworks show, the grand finale. Uh, now, there's five books within the book of Psalms. Um, the fifth one, which 145 is drawn from, um, starts at Psalm 107 and goes right to 150. And these psalms are largely psalms of David or psalms about David, psalms that were attributed to David. Uh, Some scholars think that Psalm 145 was actually the last book in this collection, so it's the grand finale, Um, and hence the explosion of praise that we just heard a few minutes ago as Suzanne was, was reading this passage. 
So then the last five chapters, 146 to 150, uh, do for the whole book of Psalms what 145 does for the fifth book of Psalms. So it's kind of like the super grand finale for the whole book of Psalms. Now, some have called Psalm 145 our teacher in how to praise God. Uh, Some of the Jewish rabbis recommended that this psalm should be read three times every day. And if you read this psalm three times every day, you can be sure that you will be part of the world to come. That was the saying. And I don't think it was because this Psalm 145 was any kind of a magic incantation, but rather the words and songs uh, that we sing, that we recite, are powerful in shaping our frame of mind. I think the Nazi movement in modern Germany knew this very well and were very intentional about the music that they aired or censured or turned out into anthems. An anthem is a powerful way to galvanize a sense of national identity. So what we listen to over and over again shapes our outlook on the world, what we value, what we hope for. And if you see the world largely as a dark place and a hopeless place, it may be worth your while to step back and look at what you're actually feeding your mind with because it may have some influence on the way you view the world. The prophet Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 26, verse 3, Thou wilt keep, and this is the King James Version, which is how I learned it originally, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. So if Psalm 145 is our teacher in how to praise God, what is it teaching us? Well, for one thing, it teaches us, I think, that words only begin to describe the praiseworthy attributes of God. An interesting fact about this particular psalm, and you can put the uh, first slide up, uh, Michael, with the whole psalm on it. I don't intend for you to read this because it's pretty small, but I just wanted to put it in front of you. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> but this is a form of Hebrew poetry in which the first letter of each verse corresponds with the successive letters of the Hebrew alphabet. So it's an, it's an acrostic. Now, if you know anything about Hebrew, you'll know that there's 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, and there's only 21 verses. So did they miss a letter? Well, actually, verse 13 um, has an extra, uh, an extra couple of lines, uh, which, again, this is probably too small for you to read, but a couple of those lines in verse 13 weren't in all the manuscripts, but in the earliest manuscripts they do appear. So that gave us the, the 22. So uh, an item of praise for every letter of the alphabet. So the psalmist exhausts all the letters of the alphabet to give God the glory which God deserves. And the psalm only ends because the psalmist has run out of letters. God's glory is, in fact, inexhaustible. One of the first and most important things that the psalmist tells us is that God is our king, and God's kingdom is everlasting. Note how the psalm begins. This is the next slide, uh, Michael. I will exalt you, my king, my God, and my king, and praise your name forever and ever. Now, we live in the dominion of Canada. Uh, we recognize King Charles now as our sovereign, but it's a pretty thin relationship. I doubt if any of us are living in fear of King Charles this morning. I doubt if many of you were thinking about him at all when you woke up. I doubt if you are thinking to yourself, uh, what can I do to serve the king today? So the concept of living under the rule of a king is difficult for us to grasp. Perhaps if we lived in the United Kingdom, we would have a different attitude toward King Charles. But even there, his reach into the lives of the average citizen is pretty minimal. In David's time, people had a much different understanding of the significance of a king. The king was responsible for providing a safe place of habitation for his citizens, ensuring that his people had food and water, ensuring that there was law and order, providing protection from enemy states. To recognize God as my king is to acknowledge that God has a very practical role in my life not simply someone that we sing about on Sunday morning, 
but someone who we look to each day and ask, how can I serve you today, my king? Because kings established the laws of the land, sometimes they lived as if they were above the law and could do as they pleased. David himself was a king, but he recognized that he served under the rule of a greater king. He was accountable to one who had far more authority than he did. If only some of our rulers recognized this reality today. Perhaps we wouldn't see so much suffering in places like Gaza, so Sudan, the Ukraine. But recognizing their place in the world applies not only to rulers and kings, but also to ordinary people like you and I. None of us are so self-important that we answer to no one. This king that David acknowledged is our king as well. His kingdom supersedes all the other kingdoms of the world. And his kingdom, according to verse 13, is an everlasting kingdom. Now, the concept of the kingdom of God is central central to our understanding of the way we function in the world. And several weeks ago, Owen just did a very awesome job of describing how the ways of the kingdom contrast with the ways of the kingdom of this world. The concept of God's kingdom is also central to this psalm, although it may not be as obvious to us as, as it is to those who are schooled in Hebrew poetry. Uh, God's kingdom is celebrated really in a masterful way at the center of this psalm in verses 11 to 13. First of all, the first letters of verses 11, 12, and 13, you can put this slide up, Michael, are the letters that are used to spell the Hebrew word for king. That's very intentional. And within these three verses, the word kingdom appears four times at the beginning, the middle, and the end. And scholars have observed, if we're reading this in the Hebrew, that these words form a triangular structure. Uh, Next slide. Thank you. Um, and the, 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 the um, so so if you know the Hebrew language, it's very obvious that the writer is making a big thing out of the kingdom of God. So the psalmist wants to shout out that God's kingdom is central, and that His rule extends through all generations. What do we learn about this king? The nature of the kingdom is influenced most directly by the nature of the king. So uh, what does the psalm tell us that the king is like? Well, for starters, no one can measure God's greatness. In verse 3, three we read, and this is on the slides, no one can measure his greatness. The theme for day camp this past week was lost in space, and that's why you see some of these uh, spacey things around the room today. Libby's message on the first day was simply this, space is big, but God is bigger. And to give some perspective, she compared the size of the earth uh, to the size of the sun. You'd remember this, Grace. Uh, If the earth was a golf ball, the sun would be uh, a ball about 15 feet in diameter. And she noted that astronomers have recently discovered what they think is the largest star in our galaxy called Canis Majoris which means something like big dog. If the earth is a golf ball, Canis Majoris is the size of Mount Everest. God spoke this and millions of other stars and planets and galaxies into existence with a word. Space is big, but God, who created all that, all that that exists in space, is bigger. In the words of the psalmist today, his greatness is unsearchable. It cannot be measured. The psalmist also tells us that God is good. In the psalm, we're reminded not only that God is great, but God is good. Uh, These two things do not always go together in the kingdoms of this world. Many of the world's leaders became great by trampling on the rights of others, trampling on their freedoms in order to rise to the top. But God is a different kind of king. Verses 7 to 10 in particular 
touch on his goodness, if you want to put that up for us, Michael. Everyone will share the story of your wonderful goodness. They will sing with joy about your righteousness. The Lord is merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry, filled with unfailing love. The Lord is good to everyone. He shows compassion on all of his creation. All of your works, we thank you, Lord. And your faithful followers will praise you. These words echo what the Lord himself used to describe himself when he revealed himself to Moses in Exodus 34, verse 6. He passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love, abounding in faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. This is the character of our God. Some people have a concept of God as this cosmic police officer uh, watching from behind the clouds, just waiting for you to make a mistake so that he can dish out some punishment. The thought of contending with a God like that is, is too much, and so they reject the idea of God altogether. But they're turning their backs on the one who loves them more than they love themselves. As children of God, we don't have to live in a constant state of fear that we're going to step out of line and incur the wrath of God because our God is good. His mercies toward us are new every morning. Far from waiting for opportunities to dish out punishment, God is looking for opportunities to shower us with all we need to thrive. Third thing that we learn from the psalm <clears throat> among other things, is that God is faithful. The psalm reminds us as well that God is faithful. Verse 13 uh, to 16 in particular, focus on the faithfulness of God, if you want to put that up, Michael. The Lord always keeps his promises. He is gracious in all he does. The Lord helps the fallen, lifts those bent beneath their loads. The eyes of all look to you in hope. You give them their food as they need it, You open your hand, you satisfy the hunger and thirst of every living thing. When we place our hope in the Lord, it's not a false hope. The Lord keeps his promises. He's faithful to his own nature. He's not good one day and a terror the next. The author of Hebrews tells us that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's faithful in giving us food and shelter that we, we need. And, and most of us have experienced this, although we don't always acknowledge that our food and our shelter is a provision from the Lord. His faithfulness is particularly good news to those who are struggling. The Lord helps the fallen and lifts those who are bent low with burdens. Stan Mast says that our great king pays attention to the least, the last, and the lost. And this is borne out in the life of Jesus who took little children into his lap in the middle of his teaching sessions, who reached out and touched people with leprosy, one of the most contagious diseases of his time, who was not afraid to be seen in the company of prostitutes and adulterers. This is a different kind of king. If you're struggling today with a load under a load of guilt and shame, Um, if you feel like your life has been one failure after another, uh, Jesus is waiting and longing to release you from that burden. And God is not waiting in the distance. Libby's second teaching point this week at day camp was simply this. God knows the stars by name, and he knows my name. God knows all those stars by name, and he knows my name. He knows who you are. He sees what you're struggling with. And he's waiting for you to take him up on his invitation to come to your aid. And fourthly, God is righteous. The psalm reminds us that God is righteous. Verses 17 to 20 in particular point to his righteousness, if we could have that on the screen. The Lord is righteous in everything he does. He is filled with kindness. The Lord is close to all who call on him. Yes, to all who call on him in truth. He grants the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cries for help and rescues them. The Lord protects those who love him, but he destroys the wicked. 
What does it mean that our king is righteous? Simply that he is the one who is right all the time. Moreover, under his rule, he will set things right. When the kingdom of God comes in its fullness, there will be no place for taking advantage over others. No place for stealing or cheating. Abusing others. These things will be banished. There won't be people living in dire poverty while others flaunt their wealth. Racism will be a thing of the past. Everyone will be treated with equal dignity. That's the future under the reign of a righteous king. You might read the psalm this morning and think, well, this is all too much pie in the sky. If this is life with God, why am I suffering with cancer? Why am I struggling to make ends meet? Why is there so much injustice in the world? And the psalms are not tone deaf to those realities. <clears throat> Within the entire collection of the psalms, there are songs of lament, there are songs of complaint, psalms questioning the wisdom of God. But this psalm is a grand finale at the end of all of that. This psalm is the final word. It's telling us that in as much as the world around us may be in turmoil, uh, the kingdom of God is a reality that cannot be shaken. The kingdom of God is the final word. And so whatever we're facing in the moment, we do not lose hope because the kingdom of God will prevail. God accomplishes his work through his people who are the hands and the feet of God on the earth. And so God is calling us to extend his reign, to expand his kingdom on our little planet here. God is calling us to seek justice because God is just. God is calling us to be generous with our resources because God treats his people with an open hand. God is calling us to be compassionate to those who are suffering because God is faithful to the least, the last, and the lost. Reviewing a psalm like this over and over again will shape what we value, it will shape what we hope for, and with the help of God, it will shape what we work toward. If we had some extra time today, perhaps we would take our English alphabet and work through the 26 letters and come up with uh, something to praise God for corresponding to each of those letters of the alphabet. You may want to do that as a homework assignment this afternoon. Uh, but in closing, let me say this. On those days when maybe you're discouraged and downtrodden, somewhat depressed, take a cue from the psalm and begin to list five or ten things, five or ten reasons to praise God. We cannot, we cannot exhaust God's goodness. He's indescribable. His kingdom is coming. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And we're a part of that. We pray with me. <clears throat> Thank you, Father, that you are good, that you are faithful, that you are righteous. And this only begins to describe who you are. Thank you that your kingdom is something that we can count on. Thank you that your kingdom is coming in greater measure. We ask, Father, that you would use us this morning to be aware of where you want to expand your kingdom in our neighborhoods and our places of work through the gifts that you have given to each one of us. Help us to speak where we need to speak to be silent where we need to be silent. We come to you this morning, our God and our King. Amen.